Well, hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all uh, to our 50% Solutions series. Thank you all for being here today. These are very difficult times, um, and we appreciate everybody coming out and joining us today. Um, today we have Siemens, who, and they're gonna talk a little bit about um, not only getting to our 50% reductions, but also doing it within the context of what our new um, workplace and office and um, building envelope situation is going to be like. So how we, you know, how we make those reductions and also keep a healthy um, air quality. So um, I wanted to first say thank you all for being here and I would like to welcome Tim Foster and David Esslinger and um, and then also say that as we as we are offering these um, these this 50% solution series to everyone we are also, we're doing this for free and it's open to the public. So um, with that said, we would welcome your donations and you may do that by going to Green Umbrella's website and clicking on the donate button. And then you can also specify that those, um, that any dollars that you donate goes to the 2030 district. So as we are, are meeting today, first of all, I'd like to say, just go ahead and um, mute yourself so that we have um, all the attention on the presenters. You can feel free to go into our chat box and ask any questions that you might have. And then at the end, we'll open it up to questions. So please feel free also, if you'd like to share your, your face with us today, we would welcome you putting on your camera. So. With that, I'd like to um, also say that we can, um, we want to open this up to have an open conversation about how we move forward. And um, please feel free to email me any questions or comments that you have. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Tim and David. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Elizabeth. So uh, I'm Tim Foster from Siemens. I work in the, uh, the large account management group here uh, based in, in Cincinnati for Siemens. And uh, David Esslinger works in our Cincinnati office as well. And David leads our energy engineering team uh, here locally. So we're both very pleased uh, to be here today. And, um, and I'm glad that uh, Cincinnati 2030 district is kind of making this opportunity. I think it's a it kind of a great way to uh, kind of build community for the 2030 district and raise awareness on uh, not just the energy issues, but kind of related issues in terms of how to make buildings perform better for uh, not just the occupants, but for the, for the bottom line. Uh, so with that, um, I know this is the third and I, uh, I thought the, uh, the first two are quite good. The uh, Malink talked about indoor air quality and Go Sustainable talked about uh, ways to uh, save substantially from an energy standpoint. So, so this presentation sort of marries those two together and it's uh, obviously very topical as we think about people re-entering the workforce and re-entering buildings and you know what are kind of the operational strategies and what are the kind of the basic blocking and tackling that uh, the building owner should be thinking about in these times in order to improve the, the health and wellness of their buildings, as well as continue to manage uh, energy and, and carbon. Uh, so with that, uh, these are the, uh, the learning objectives. So we'd like to talk about common challenges to uh, facility operations. And obviously this has been impacted in, in many areas by the, uh, the current, uh, current challenges. Uh, we'd like to summarize the what we'll call emerging public health recommendations. Uh, certainly nothing has been formalized, but I think things are starting to coalesce in terms of uh, uh, steps that building operators should take from a, uh, an engineering control standpoint. Uh, increased outside air ventilation, uh, maintain humidity levels, and also improve filtration and air cleaning in buildings. Uh, third, we want to talk about how to look at the problem as a holistic problem and not just a how do we drive down operational costs or how do we focus specifically on improving health, but really as a whole, holistic solution. And particularly, you know, thinking about some of the upcoming financial and budgetary challenges that uh, all, of our, all of our organizations are going to be faced with 
uh, it's going to be hard to compete with those dollars to, uh, to kind of implement some of these solutions. So the, that's really the importance in our mind of really adopting that holistic approach. And fourth, because Siemens is a building technologies company, and that's uh, where we see the industry going in terms of how can technology be used to create smart buildings and high performance buildings. Uh, we want to share some of those uh, those tools that can be implemented today, and also so some tools on where the where the general industry is heading. So that's the objectives. Um, as Elizabeth said, if anybody has questions on the way. Um, feel free to, to put those in a text box and to the extent we can see those and get to those, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try to address those. So anyway, a um, couple of quotes that, uh, the, 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 you know, what, what are we hearing from experts? And I kind of updated this yesterday just to kind of reflect latest thinking, but uh, upper left box, certainly there's been a lot of speculation about how the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, virus is translated or transmitted through buildings. Uh, everybody's aware of the fomite transmission was where it falls into objects in, in a workplace or workspace or frequently touched objects. The, the question was, does it transmit as an aerosol, which would be airborne for a certain amount of periods and, and by and large, can that be recirculated through buildings? So there was just a, a a paper submitted to the New England Journal of Medicine uh, over the weekend, I think, and, uh, and I've included a footnote there if you wanted to, to, to look at that. But uh, based on that preliminary information they've had is that uh, both aerosols um, could be affected for multiple hours, um, I think two to three hours in some cases. So, so, so theoretically, and they, they formulated that it is plausible that uh, that live, you know, pathogens could be recirculated through a typical commercial HVAC system. So, so that's obviously, you know, some cause of concern. Um, second box I saw that was interesting, the upper right about air filtration, uh, a quote from the CEO of Cushman and Wakefield, uh, because, you know, China is probably several months ahead of us from impact and they're obviously, you know, returning to buildings, returning to building the economy. Uh, Cushman manages, you know, several million square feet in the Chinese space. The, the CEO made the inter uh, interview with Forbes magazine made the point that that air filtration is probably the most important lesson learned from China. Uh, reason being is that the Chinese buildings, particularly in large urban areas, um, have much more advanced filtration systems compared to the U.S. Just because they're trying to circulate, you know, as much out as much indoor air as they can just because of the general pollution problems in a lot of their urban areas. So, uh, you know, air filtration in China and Chinese buildings is, uh, is, is probably state of the art compared to, uh, to other countries just for that reason. The lesson learned here is that they're, they're finding that these advanced filtration systems are, are effective. So I think that's uh, maybe some early lessons learned from the field and feedback to look at. Uh, lower left box, uh, some of you might have seen OSHA uh, release some guidance for preparing workplaces for COVID-19. And I think the significance of this that, you know, those of you who have dealt with OSHA or, or looked at OSHA compliance over the years is that, you know, uh, OSHA, the, the, the onus for compliance is typically on the, the, the building owner or the workplace owner, not necessarily the employees. So OSHA's weighed in on COVID-19 and they've also uh, suggested that their uh, high, what they call their hierarchy of controls, which is kind of a framework that they look at for controlling workplace hazards, that they've applied kind of that historical framework or that conventional framework. And what they're saying is that the uh, the best way to control a hazard is to uh, to remove that from the workplace as kind of the first uh, the first stage of control, as well as others. And I've got a uh, my, my fourth slide kind of expands that a bit on the, uh, on the OSHA recommendations. And then finally, in the, the lower right box, I included a, a quote from uh, Joseph G. Allen, who runs the Healthy Buildings Program at the Harvard School of Public Health, and who's, uh, I think even Malink may have quoted some of their, uh, uh, th that, that school's um, research on, on cognitive uh, improvements with, with better indoor air quality. Uh, but obviously, they're uh, 
they're a pretty good source at this point on kind of all things buildings. And his quote is, we need to uh, really unleash the, the power of our buildings to help, uh, to help, help control the, the health and wellness, you know, particularly the standpoint that, you know, we spend 90% of our time indoors. Uh, so really healthy buildings should be, you know, priority one as a, uh, is, is a country for, uh, you know, improving the situation. So as I mentioned before, uh, this, this slide really talks to workplace controls and it's, it's kind of uh, summarized from OSHA and put in, put in the format of OSHA language. Uh, the hierarchy of controls, they talk about engineering controls, administrative controls, uh, safe work practices, and then, and then PPE, uh, which I think if you look at those bullet items, we're, we're all by now, you know, all experts on, uh, on, on what those mean and how those are likely to be rolled out in the workplace. But for the purposes of this presentation today, I really wanted <coughs> to, uh, to focus on engineering controls and that are what are the things that uh, can be done within the building, uh, particularly the HVAC system, that can help mitigate or remove some of the, uh, the pathogens or other, other threats from the building. And as you see, the high efficiency filters, ventilation, and, and particularly to have a discussion on, uh, on, on, on how those, from a practical standpoint, uh, may be implemented both in the near term and, and the long term. Uh, just a couple of thoughts about high efficiency filters and that, you know, we were talking before, that could be a whole uh, seminar in itself on selecting filters. And I think uh, David may have a couple of comments just in general about high efficiency filters, but there, there's, there's probably a double edged need right now. I mean, one is, is, is obviously removing uh, or if possible slowing down any, any particular aerosol spread as we talked before. But the other is just, you know, VOCs and other uh, off-gassing in the environment just with the amount of cleaning. I mean, some of these buildings are being cleaned five, six, seven times the amount of what we're, you know, they may be typically in, in, uh, designed for. So um, we'll probably need more filtration and, and, and um, ventilation rates just to offset some of the uh, additional, you know, cleaning products and, and, and other uh, you know other uh, things in the in the environment from in terms of indoor air quality. Um, so, kind of switching gears. So th this is kind of a, uh, a a slide that we've used at Siemens to kind of level set you know, in terms of, of trying to understand what facility management challenges are. So this was uh, kind of put together before the current crisis, and 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 one of the boxes was kind of the unknown. What you know future you know what what's the uh, uh, future challenges that may have. So obviously we've kind of run smack into a, a future challenge now in terms of of what are the facility management challenges. But but, but just in general is is kind of we look at uh, O and M organizations that you know whether it's a large college campus or a hospital or a you know commercial building or a set of small buildings. These all seem to be somewhat common challenges. Uh, most organizations can probably say you know two or three of these are top of mind. Um, but, you know, if, if you look at how some of these uh, areas have been ex exasperated by the, uh, the current situation, you know, certainly from a manpower standpoint, the fact that uh, building owners and, and managers are, uh, you know, because of social distancing, you're going to have less of a staff on site. Uh, people are working multiple crews, uh, service companies that are relying on are all the same. So people are much more spread out. So it's a lot more incumbent to be able to use uh, technology and tools to be able to, to help operate these buildings. Uh, second item of concern might be aging equipment and infrastructure. You know, it's one thing to make a recommendation that, yeah, we should bring in a lot more outside air into these buildings, um, you know, without kind of a high performance building uh, understanding and standard. And, um, you know, this could be problematic for some of the, the older equipment that maybe has not been maintained as, as well as it should. Um, you know, so we could have a situation for anything from someone propping a two by four and an outside air damper to bring in ventilation uh, to really trying on the other you know, side of the coin, really trying to do a kind of a whole performance uh, enhancement of the, of the whole ventilation system and, and probably everything in between. So obviously aging infrastructure is gonna be a challenge for many of these buildings that weren't designed to bring in this amount of outside air. Um, 
excessive comfort calls, occupant comfort, you know, most of that has been, I think, traditionally building operators have really been more concerned about uh, thermal, you know, hot, cold calls. I mean, Bohm and others have done studies over the year that, you know, almost 30% of uh, building occupants are not happy with comfort. And so as a result, that becomes uh, pretty much the overriding concern in some cases for a lot of building staff is chasing hot you know, and generically, they, they call that the hot cold call list. And, you know, uh, O&M companies would track how many calls they get from tenants and so on. Um, certainly with people uh, rightly concerned about how healthy their environment is, are they concerned? I, I would expect that there's going to be a lot more calls about ventilation and airflow and filtration and cleaning and, and, and it could be an overwhelming situation. And unless, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the building maintenance and operators uh, take a proactive uh, view of that. Um, the, the other two boxes I'll comment on quickly. I mean, one obviously is rising operating costs, and we, we touched on that briefly, is that, you know, a lot of these uh, in, increases in, in ventilation, you know, by and large, we've, uh, we've tightened our buildings up in the last, you know, 20, 30, 40 years considerably from an outside air standpoint, from an envelope standpoint. Uh, a lot of these buildings just aren't designed particularly to bring in large amounts of outside air like, um, you know, like, like it, uh, it, even if it's desirable to do that uh, under certain conditions, you know, typically a day like today, uh, obviously with, with, with uh, motorized economizers on air handling units, you're, you're, you're good, but uh, where we'll probably see challenges is in, you know, very hot weather and very, very cold weather. So the question is, how do we implement these things? Uh, number one, to find capacity in the buildings to be able to bring in more outside air and, and you know, more fan horsepower for, for uh, uh, filtration uh, as we see pressure drops across uh, filtration systems. You know, there's a capacity issue, but also, you know, from a, from a 2030 standpoint, um, you know, there's an energy issue. So how do we, how do we mitigate that and maybe balance the, the, the difference between energy and and, uh, um, and, and and operational, you know, health and, and safety. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll comment on is this lack of transparency. I, I know we've, you know, we've had calls on from managers of buildings that said, how can we determine what our outside air is now? If the, if the mandate is, hey, we need more, you know, isn't there some standard where we, we should be able to determine what, you know, how is our system operating now? And the, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, one, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty complex, uh, you know, in addition to mechanical ventilation, you have infiltration, you have the effect of wind, you know, for tall buildings, you have a stack effect. So the dynamics of determining how much outside air you have is, is more than just mechanical ventilation. Uh, but even if it was mechanical ventilation, the fact is a lot of building automation systems and systems in general uh, either indirectly calculate that or they don't do a good job at all of calculating that. So you're kind of relying on, you know, maybe historical balancing reports and, and that sort of thing. So, so those are kind of the over overarching uh, challenges that we see. And the one thing I think that, that, that is been good in the, in the building industry the last couple of years has really emerged this concept of, um, you know, look, look at a building as being a, not just, a, you know, an, an, a, an energy efficient exercise, but, but more of a, that, that holistic approach. And the, uh, the, the pyramid on the left, I'm sure a lot of you have seen, has been, you know, very popular in, in presentations to kind of illustrate that point. Uh, this is actually uh, popularized by uh, JLL, who's a, a large uh, property management company globally. But, but they've, they've kind of make the point to kind of illustrate uh, this, that, you know, energy efficiency in a building, you know, say if that's $3 per square foot, that's the, you know, the building owner's cost for utilities. Uh, the overall, you know, space cost might be for market value, say that's $30, so that's 10 times. So, you know, the, 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 the cost of, this, of the space itself is 10 times, uh, except if you're in Manhattan, then it's, you know, probably over $100 a square foot. Uh, but but the, really the biggest cost in a building and the biggest opportunity in a building for improvement is not energy or the cost of the space. It's the, the people and productivity 
uh, that are working in that building. So $300 a square foot uh, is representative of, of salaries of people, of uh, disruption, of, of recruiting, uh, turnover, sick days, you know, however you want to look at that. The, 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 uh, from a financial standpoint, the stakes are certainly much higher for building operators to focus on that 300. And so, um, you know, we, we believe that uh, all three of those are interrelated, you know, space utilization, workforce productivity, and building efficiency. You know, so we, we think that the, the way to really drive the best solutions is try to harmonize all three and, uh, and also recruit stakeholders from all three. So, you know, ordinarily say, uh, I saw a, a, a survey that said who, who in companies is leading up the go back to work effort within buildings. And I think, you know, 78% of the companies said, well, that's, that's our HR team has really kind of taken over that. Ordinarily, you wouldn't talk to HR about ventilation or, or, or filtration and air healing units. But this is probably a time you would. And, and the reason being is that I think the more stakeholders you have at the bottom of that pyramid, and that's another reason why I think they have a, a pyramid shape, uh, the better the foundation is to build these solutions. So, you know, I, I know a lot of times as energy efficiency professionals, we, we sometimes focus in on what's the best payback, you know, particularly if you have a limited budget and say, you know, you've got $100,000 in our energy efficiency budget to spend. You know, we'd like to say, hey, I want to, I want to invest that so I get the best payback from an energy standpoint. Um, you know, in, in, in many cases that can be, you know, kind of a split incentives issue where if you work with, with other folks that are in charge of space efficiency or overall people efficiency, there may be more, uh, you know, benefit to the whole organization just looking at that singularly. So, so that's what that's trying to say is that um, let's look at these buildings from a really holistic standpoint. And from a, from a cost standpoint, um, this is really where uh, technology comes into play. And the, the, the premise here is that um, most buildings, you know, building owners, maintenance staffs are kind of in this reactive mode where they're answering hot cold calls, breakdowns. If, if we can flip that script and give them better intelligence, better analytics, um, we, can, we can change that reactive maintenance to predictive maintenance. Uh, have better performing buildings, higher performance performing buildings, and at the same time, not only reduce the their operations and maintenance costs, but also the energy costs by making the buildings higher performance. So that's the uh, that, that's the basic model that, from a technology standpoint, that we we try to look at is how to how to look holistically at, at all those buckets and, and drive down the uh, operating costs in the. Uh, so, um, so I'm going to ask David now to kind of get into some uh, explanation on, uh, you know, and, and, and this, this admittedly, this, this presentation is kind of aimed towards larger, um, larger building air handling systems. So this is an illustration of a build-up air handling system with hydronic valves, you know, cooling coils and central chiller plants and that sort of thing. Obviously, not all buildings are going to have that, but, 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 but the ideas are basically the same. So if you don't have that, you may have a packaged rooftop unit or, or some other means of heating and cooling. But, but a lot of the ideas, I think, can be applicable uh, across you know, most building types. So David, if you don't mind, could you uh, sure. kind of lead us, lead us through the fault detection and, and some of the other examples here? Yeah, yes. And on the previous slide, Tim was emphasizing that analytics is the key to transitioning from a reactive maintenance to a predictive maintenance mode, and also a way to save energy and maybe offset some of the increased operating costs we're going to have through increased ventilation or other COVID-19 mitigation strategies. Um, but, but what is analytics, particularly when it comes to looking at HVAC systems? Sometimes it's referred to as fault detection and diagnostics, and uh, where we apply rules to analyze if something is going wrong with an air handler. Now, these rules aren't alarms. This isn't an alarm to tell you that the supply fan has stopped running or the space temperature or the um, supply air temperature is way too high. But in fact, they're, they're more um, faults that can grow over time to indicate that they, you might have a dirty filter or you might have a leaking heating or cooling coil valve. 
Um, and these rules are best applied over a uh, batch of historical data. So rather than looking at instances in time and flagging alarms, we call them faults and looks over a body of evidence. And that is best done in the cloud rather than on site in a building automation system server. Um, typically that information is gathered from the, uh, the billing automation system and put up into the cloud. Um, there are lots of software packages out there. Siemens has its own, of course, to, to marry not only with its own building automation system, but, uh, but others as well. So I don't know how many of you have our facility managers yourself or can relate to um, a weekly exercise when the operator comes in, <clears throat> you know, a maintenance supervisor comes in and spends a couple hours every Monday morning paging through all the equipment screens looking for potential issues, whether that's a stuck air damper or um, something not running. If you could have a Sentinel that is uh, viewing that information all the time, analyzing it and spitting out when there are faults, um, that's a much more efficient use of time. And a lot of times the, the energy benefits that go along with identifying and correcting these issues pale into comparison to the uh, personnel savings from being able to direct your maintenance folks as efficiently as possible. Tim, I think we can move on. So this slide is um, kind of a compare and contrast the traditional uh, checklist of, of things that you inspect every year on an air handler versus rules and faults that we can look for on a continuous basis. And this fits really nicely in with a continuous commissioning process rather than a one-time check of an air handler where it may be once a year, or once every three years, where you really go through and, and, and look at all the calibration of all the sensors and um, all the other factors that drive the air handler's operation. It's much better to look for correlations between those um, sensors and the operation of the unit to see if there's anything going amiss. And it's much more efficient to do with uh, fault detection. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, that's fine. Um, this is an example of results from a continuous commissioning process at the University of Oregon, one of their air handlers, that if we just look at one parameter that drives energy, that's of course the ventilation speed or the, the fan speed, um, this fan was operating during weekdays and a little on the weekend and uh, averaging about 70% speed um, and even higher on Mondays and Tuesdays. But afterwards, after the continuous commissioning process and going through and looking at faults, identified some issues, the um, operation of the fan became uh, much more predictable and uh, consumed less energy. Now this could be from various things, identifying you know, uh, dampers, uh, issues, could be filter issues. But a lot of times when you look at a fan operating like this at a high VFD speed, it pushes you to look downstream at some of the VAV boxes and other terminal devices. So not only can we take in information into a cloud-based data analytics system from the air handlers, but also from the terminal devices to look for uh, damper issues and valve issues on those. And sometimes those drive, um, uh, fixing those issues can really have a significant impact on the air handler itself. And I suspect this, that was the case here. We found some terminal devices that were wide open and by being able to control them again, the fan came back under control and used less energy. So these, this is an example of how to view terminal devices in kind of a visual way rather than a big long list. I mean, for an individual air handler, you might have 50 terminal devices. So it's hard to scroll through those on a manual uh, process 
you know, every Monday morning, you might be able to look at the air handlers, but you're, there's no way you're going to be able to scroll through all the terminal devices. And if we can look for just a few things going wrong on a terminal device, including um, overcooling or overheating, or maybe the flow is deviating from set point, and then flag the uh, boxes with the biggest problems and putting it in a visual type format like this, then we can really uh, focus our maintenance dollars and, uh, and personnel on the most prevalent issues. So you would think that um, you know, a graphic like this could help you predict where you're gonna have hot and cold calls today, and rather than waiting for them, let's go to F2916, go to that room and see what's, what's wrong with that box. Um, and it might have something to do with the, uh, the flow as well. So uh, you can use this information to uh, really dial in not only air handlers, but the VAV boxes. Yeah, I think the other thing, David, is uh, particularly the, the comment before about uh, CFM set point of boxes. So you can open up your outside air dampers and bring in more ventilation, but you still have to identify uh, spaces in the in the building that just may be dead spaces without flow or, or may, may need rebalance or some other issue like uh, if you look at uh, you know 2914 in the lower left there that's a that's kind of a chronic uh, flow versus set point issue which may not you know but more than just temperature it may determine there's not adequate ventilation in that space right right um so the next slide, if, if we bring this back to the relevant discussion of COVID-19, um, in addition to temperature, comfort, and energy, we also want to look at other indoor air quality issues. Uh, Tim mentioned humidity. Um, I, I can easily understand the correlation between high humidity and growth of fungus molds and other things, but um, I was really struggling until recently to understand how humidity played a role in the spread of, of, of viruses. And I heard everything from, you know, the, the right humidity levels will allow the right moisture content in your nasal, nasal passages and lungs to help your um, mucus system work better. But I read a really good article the other day that talked about that, that really the issue is when you have an aerosol uh, breathing or sneezing, and it's contaminated aerosol, those uh, viruses are encapsulated in, in moisture uh, particles. And if the humidity is too low, those, uh, the moisture surrounding the virus will actually evaporate, leaving the virus in sort of a desiccated form that is much smaller and much lighter. And so it stays in the, it stays uh, airborne longer instead of settling on surfaces, and it will actually pass through uh, more filters. Compared to if it, you're in the right humidity levels, the moisture doesn't evaporate, and you have a much larger particle that encapsulates the, the virus. And so keeping relative humidity in that sweet spot from 40 to 60, that's always been important in ORs, operating rooms and hospitals, but now let's think about that as important in um, all spaces for health and well-being. So um, to transition a little bit here and speak briefly about the largest energy consumer in a building um, besides lighting is typically the, uh, the chilling, chill water or air conditioning systems. Um, all the things that we're doing to improve ventilation uh, downstream at the boxes and then the air handlers will help uh, reduce load off of the uh, chill water system. Unfortunately, if we're going to increase the amount of outside air coming in, the amount of fresh air to help with health and indoor air quality, then we're going to put more strain on those uh, chilled water systems this summer. So watching the efficiency of those chill water systems is very important. And um, the analytical tools available are, are a great way to do that. Because if you just look at your uh, chill water plant on any given day, it's really hard to make a, you know, a qualitative judgment whether it's using too much energy or is just right. 
or is, or is a very efficient in operating because you, you really, it's hard time, it's a hard to correlate load and energy, especially if you're looking at the individual pieces of equipment. If you wrap them all together and calculate a cumulative KW per ton and compare that to um, where you think you should be, and it's not just one number, you shouldn't just be at 0.8 KW per ton, it's a fluctuating target based on load, outdoor air temperature, et cetera. And uh, by charting all those factors, putting them together, we can predict what KW per ton could be, compare that to actual, and uh, maybe compare that to an old baseline where you were before an optimization of a chilled water plant happened, then you really get an idea of, of your biggest energy user and how well it's operating. Yeah, the other point here is that, um, you know, we, we usually look at this as a way to increase the efficiency of a chilled water plant, but the, uh, you know, the other side of the coin of efficiency uh, often is capacity. So, uh, you know, we're aware of a lot of buildings that would uh, start restricting outside air when it's, you know, 90 plus degrees out, high humidity days, uh, just because they don't have enough capacity. So, and in in, uh, in in some cases, even though the majority of savings are probably under part load conditions for these sort of things, uh, there are some kind of design capacity uh, additions that can be found that could could be helpful in some cases, and you know, kind of mitigating where your chilled water system is just not sized enough to bring in more outside air. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Um, so, uh, in, in the interest of time, I will kind of speed up here a bit. But uh, you know, the other thing I think that uh, a lot of a lot of folks are really seeing the value of is is delivering uh, not just the uh, analytics remotely, but just remote service. So, uh, you know, I think this is probably a good time for every uh, building automation system provider and, and uh, operation provider to really be aware of you know how how much of this can be now be done remotely i mean we the studies that we've seen internally at least that you know about 60 percent of our service calls can be resolved remotely uh, so um, not only is that a savings from rolling a truck but if you look at you know access to areas and getting through security and uh, and filling out uh, you know COVID 19 forms on you know it's just a, a lot a lot harder process to get access and uh, working with people on you know second and third shift uh, so, so this is uh, this is probably something minimally you know look into that with your building automation system provider and how you can deliver service remotely uh, to uh, to really take advantage of some of these tools um, and just kind of digressing a little bit uh, wanted to kind of do a, a, a point about um, where technology is going, and, and this is available today, and, and I think we'll start to see widespread adoption. But, you know, for example, I've, I've put up a uh, kind of a cleaning protocol, and this, this is actually, a, a, I think, from a Siemens standpoint, this is what we're uh, we're, we're doing to, with our offices nationwide. Is is a cleaning protocol, and it's it's based on the uh, CDC guidelines for uh, for the different levels of, uh, of of hazard in the space. But if anybody that's going to implement these, and I, I would assume that uh, we're going to go into kind of a high clean state, um, huge amount of effort, time, expense to, to clean buildings. Uh, and, and it's all based on, you know, times per day and, and so on, like common area cleaning four times per day, et cetera. So one of the, 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 the things that we think we're going to see is, is be able to adjust cleaning schedules uh, based on actual building usage. So this is an example of a kind of a dense uh, smart sensor system that you would install um, in your buildings to, um, to really um, kind of measure, you know, as people move throughout the facility. So you create this, uh, this map that kind of shows the relative use. And this could be a cut of a, you know, an eight hour period or a, a four hour period or whatever the, whatever the report may be. But it really gives you maybe more actionable data. So instead of cleaning every restroom uh, four times a day, uh, maybe you can kind of spot the restrooms that have the most, and then you can kind of deploy your your cleaning resources to uh, to w where they uh, you know were likely to be the the most uh, most effective, as well as other areas of the office. 
in uh, so, so the challenge is if you're running cleaning operational say well that's pretty expensive i mean we're not going to install you know thousands of sensors in our space just to improve our cleaning you know i agree you probably wouldn't but the uh, the idea of this iot enabled uh, smart sensing world that we're we're all entering into is that that data can be shared and used in in multiple applications so you know, think of uh, think of any application in a building where you where you really want to understand in a very granular way building occupancy. So that could be anything from you know HVAC strategies, uh, lighting strategies, and and very often these things are associated with a lighting control system to be able to do uh, localized lighting and daylighting and, and so on. But even beyond that, just from a real estate standpoint, I mean, the real estate industry is really going to be challenged with space utilization. You know, on one hand, companies are trying to reduce space utilization, or at least were, um, you know, based on hoteling and work from home. And, and so uh, on one hand, there's a market that says, hey, we're going to cut our space down. And now with others with social distancing, now there's a say, hey, we need to make sure people are spread out throughout a facility and we want to be able to monitor the effectiveness of that. So this kind of illustrates how an investment in one technology, you know, smart sensing in a space can pay off in multiple ways uh, to the benefit of the whole you know, building portfolio and really create some, some high performance buildings. So that's one example. And uh, that will end kind of our presentation here and um, be happy to answer any, any questions or, or just have a discussion about uh, any, any of these things. So. But again, I appreciate the opportunity to, to address everybody. Everybody can feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. Tim, there's a question about uh, smart sensing, the technology you just mentioned, and uh, what companies offer uh, that technology. Uh, I, I just uh, and, and I, I apologize if, if people were uh, were sending questions. I didn't I didn't see anything pop up, but um, I, I would say in general, I mean, it's uh, there's been some, certainly some early adopters in the marketplace that have, have, have used this, but. Um, we're, we're seeing it more and more um, just because it's expedient. A lot of times from, from a new construction standpoint, it's built into the lighting system just because lighting is, is uh, you know, so, so prevalent and there's already kind of a built-in power grid and supply. So these are, are typically sensors that can be mounted, uh, light fixtures, you know, say one every, you know, 100 square feet or whatever it may be. So you have multiple sensors within a space. And, and typically they're wireless and uh, they would feed that information either into a local, a local system or more often than not, they would feed it into a web-based system. But um, yeah, I don't want to mention specific manufacturers or, or anything like that, but, but, but obviously Siemens is one and, uh, and, and there are others, but uh, this is a, I think a high growth area. It was before COVID-19 and um, I, I think it's, I think it's probably going to see particularly in, larger complexes I, I think it'll uh, it'll be more more common as we move forward um, I have a question as people as as spaces are adapting and um, workspaces may be reconfigured or um, you know make making space either more spread out or more condensed due to more people working from home is that an opportunity to make some upgrades to their to their space to their HVAC yeah David you may have some thoughts on that but yeah I would, I would certainly think so I mean that I, I think that should be, be be part of the strategy and I know I know a lot of uh, the leading property managers have kind of centered in on, you know, on, on space. You know, I think there was a thought stat that the average, average uh, workspace assigned in the, in the U S was like 200 square, you know, uh, 200 square feet per person, which is a, you know, you calculate it out in the square is less than a, uh, 
I'm sorry, 20 square feet, which is less than a, a, a kind of a six foot radius. So, so certainly I think they're going to be seeing um, ways to, uh, to kind of mitigate, um, you know, the, the direct spread through, through shields and something like that. But uh, I would think an HVAC study has to be part of, part of any kind of an implementation to make sure that, um, you know, flow patterns and CFMs and, you know, enough, uh, enough fresh air and indoor air quality is being maintained. Yeah, that's right. And, and as spaces are utilized differently, we can think about ventilation rates uh, being different. So while we might need more outside air, maybe you want to reduce the overall uh, supply air volume because there are fewer people in the space, um, or we just don't want to blow around the aerosols as, as aggressively. So um, right. we can, uh, you know, the, those systems that have constant volume fans out there uh, really would look towards variable volume fan retrofits and uh, being able to uh, modulate those speeds based on uh, some dynamic uh, factors in the building. Yeah, I, th I think the other factor too is that um, I, I don't know if, if if folks on the phone are are familiar with say how a consulting engineer would would calculate ventilation in a space, but there's basically two options. One is kind of a a fixed option based on what the intended use of the space might be. So if it's a you know say a, say an office, they'll look at a certain density times so many CFM per person. That's that's obviously can be expensive from an energy standpoint. So there's an alternative method uh, called demand control ventilation, which typically involves monitoring uh, CO2 levels in a space. And then the, the CO2 level becomes a, uh, a surrogate um, marker for human respiration. And so uh, based on a CO2 level, you can kind of predict or, or kind of see how many people are, are likely in the space at that time. The issue with, with CO2 is where it's, it's a good general marker. Um, it, it does have some lag time. So I've seen, I've seen a lot of folks making recommendations that, hey, we really should kind of uh, disable some of the demand control ventilation for the time being and, uh, and maybe look at some alternative ways, you know, because if you have a conference room that's empty, uh, 10 people walk in, you know, the CO2 sensor is probably not going to see that for, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, sometimes so that it tends to be kind of a lag. So I think these kind of alternative people counter methods are, are probably going to be uh, explored more than, than maybe they were before just because of the, 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 the safety aspect of it. I uh, was wondering if, Tim, if you guys could maybe touch on a little bit about the different uh, sort of healthy building ratings systems that are out there and sort of whether or not you had any high level uh, insights into maybe some of the nuances between them, such as fit well and well. Uh, yeah, I, I, I cannot. And I, I um, uh, David, I don't know if you have any experience with that, but um, no. Uh, other than I listed those because I know those are out there and, uh, and, and certainly there's, there's folks in Cincinnati that are, are not more tuned into that. Um, I think the uh, M&A uh, presentation next week, I know they're, uh, um, you know, tuned into the, the well-certified standards. Um, so, so I think, uh, I, I think from what we're seeing, you know, if you had to kind of see where is that at, uh, the, the healthy building standards are kind of where, you know, I would, I would say where, where LEED was uh, 10, 15 years ago, you know, kind of early adopters are interested. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's actually a building right next door to us here um, that, that I think is the, the first and, and maybe the only well-certified building in, in Cincinnati, we, we, right next to our office out here in Forest Park. And uh, so it was kind of interesting looking at that case study. But, uh, but, but I, you know, if you had to make a prediction, you would certainly see that these standards are now front and center for, for IAQ. Um, and, and David, I don't know if you can add to that um, about differences in any of these. Not to the rating systems, no. I was wondering, um, are there any general uh, recommendations that 
um, people can sort of implement as they begin to move back to their workspace um, or are dealing with operations right now? Um, are there any general recommendations in dealing with our new COVID pandemic? Uh, Elizabeth, I mean, other than the kind of the, the ones that I listed from, you know, kind of on that, that second, third slide on the, the different protocols and, you know, engineering versus safety and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think if I were a building owner, um, I would probably start with the, just the very basics and, and say, because it, it's hard to say you know, because this stuff is changing so quickly, um, you know, certainly you wouldn't go out and replace your HVAC system unless there's some other compelling need. But, but if, you know, you would probably want to uh, at least understand in your building how you're bringing in outside air, where the outside air is being brought in, to what extent the controls are working or not working that you can predict. Uh, and then if you, you know, to the extent that you, that you uh, decide more outside air is called for, how can you do that from a performance standpoint? So, so I know that that's pretty pretty general, but I, I think uh, I think a lot of folks are kind of starting from that that um, you know that that aspect uh, because there isn't a lot of visibility maybe outside the uh, original design documents and, and times on what uh, you know what uh, what those uh, air change rates are. Yeah, that and checking on the the integrity and the condition of air filters. Yes. Uh, we go into a lot of these places and, and the air filter has got a, a tag on a maintenance tag that says it was inspected last week. And turns out that the inspector came by, read the Delta P across the filter. And because the fan speed was so low at that moment in time, the filter passed, but you open it up and it's, obviously coated in grime and um, so much so that um, when the fans at full speed, it'll actually break apart the filter. And so I think looking at the, those and changing those to um, you know, the highest quality filter you can find, is a good recommendation. Highest quality filter you, that will fit, I should say. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And I, I think, you know, in, in, in general, people should probably be educated about how filters are rated you know there's a there's a, a MERV system uh, that that kind of